Hello, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you may be, wherever you may be sitting, um, standing, outside, inside, in your home, wherever it may be. Hello, how are you? Um, today I'm going to be reading you all a story. Before I get started with that, though, I just wanted you all to know that I'm thinking of you, each and every one of you that's watching this. Um, each student, each teacher, each individual. Um, I know this is a difficult time for everyone, but we will get through it. We will. Um, I hope you're doing things that you love. I hope you're um, learning something new, whether that is education, educational or not educational. Um, I hope you're just really um, using this time to to grow within your own self. But today we're going to be reading a book called The Bracelet. Um, the Bracelet by Yoshiko Yoshida. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, this is a great book. Um, while I'm reading this, I, I really just want you to sit back and listen. Um, just sit, listen, think about, put yourself in the main character's shoes. Um, think about how you would feel if this was going on in your life, if you were uprooted from your normalcy, um, which I know we're kind of all um, experiencing a little bit, you know, our whole normal, everything that we're used to going to school, um, any, your daily routine has been kind of whacked. Um, it's kind of been taken from you a little bit. Um, but imagine that being because of how you looked, um, in the mirror or how you appeared to others or how you spoke or your culture or who you came from. Imagine it being nothing, uh, because of who you are. Um, that's difficult. That's difficult for most of us to understand. It's difficult um, for us to always have empathy for this, but I do want us to grow in sympathy for it. Um, yeah, so let's go ahead and get started. I This is a great, great book. Um, this is a little bit about the author. I'll, I'll leave the screen on while I'm talking just so you can read it. Um, but basically, this book is about... Um, Shortly after the United States entered World War II, so um, prior to World War II, um, there was an attack on Pearl Harbor by uh, Japan. And so the United States panicked. They panicked, and everyone who was Japanese or had Japanese ancestry, and they lived in the United States, they were um, took to camps. They were, in turn, forced to move to guarded camps. Um, so they had to pick up everything, and they their whole lives changed. Um, and most were American citizens who had been born here and had done, done nothing wrong. Um, nevertheless, the U.S. government feared that they might give support to Japan, so they put them put them in these internment camps after the war and um, or during the war, excuse me, and locked them up. And they weren't treated like normal human beings should be treated. Um, they didn't have the same rights. They didn't have the freedom of speech, the freedom of will that we are also lucky to have to this day. Um, and a lot of times after the, or after the war ended, a lot of the Japanese Americans found their other, that other people had taken over their homes and businesses. So that even when things went back to quote unquote normal, it really was not normalcy. Um, let's go ahead and get started though. So like I said, this is called The Bracelet by Yoshika Yoshida. Sit back, follow along, get a snack, get a, something to drink, um, just listen, okay? Just listen as I read. Mama, is it time to go? I hadn't planned to cry, but the tears came suddenly, and I wiped them away with the back of my hand. I didn't want my older sister to see me crying. It's almost time, Rory, my mother said gently. Her face was filled with a kind of sadness I have never seen before. I looked around at my empty room, the clothes that Mama always told me to hang up in the closet, the junk pile on my dresser, the old rag doll I could never bear to part with. They were all gone. There was nothing left in my room, and there was nothing left in the rest of the house. The rugs and furniture were gone, the pictures and drapes were down, and the closets and cupboards were empty. The house was like a gift box after the nice things inside were gone. Just a lot of nothingness. It was almost time to leave our home, but we weren't moving to a nicer house or a new town. It was April 21st, 1942. The United States and Japan were at war, and every Japanese person on the West Coast was being evacuated by the government to a concentration camp. Mama, my sister Kiko, and I were being sent from our home and out of Berkeley and eventually out of California. The doorbell rang, and I ran to answer it before my sister could. I thought maybe by some miracle a messenger from the government might be standing there, tall and proper, buttoned into a uniform, come to tell us it was all a terrible mistake, that we... 
that we wouldn't have to leave after all. Or maybe the messenger would have a telegram from Papa, who was interned in a prison of war camp in Montana because he had worked for a Japanese business firm. The FBI had come to pick up Papa and hundreds of other Japanese community leaders on the very day that Japanese planes had bombed Pearl Harbor. The government thought they were dangerous enemy aliens, and if it weren't so sad, it would have been if it weren't so sad, it would have been funny. Papa could no more be dangerous than the mayor of our city, and he was every bit as loyal to the United States. He had lived here since 1917. When I opened the door, it wasn't, it wasn't a messenger from anywhere. It was my best friend, Lori Madison, from next door. She was holding a package wrapped up like a birthday present, but she wasn't wearing her party dress and her face dropped, drooped like a wilted tulip. Hi, she said. I came to say goodbye. She thrust the present at me and told me it was something to take to camp. It's a bracelet, she said before I could open the package. Put it on so you won't have to pack it. She knew I didn't have one inch of space left in my suitcase. We'd been instructed to take only what we could carry into camp, and Mama told us that we could each only take only two suitcases. Then how are we ever going to pack the dishes and the blankets and the sheets they told us to bring with us, Kiko worried. I don't really know, Mama said, and she simply began packing those big impossible things into a normal stuffle bag, along with umbrellas, boots, a kettle, hot plate, and flashlight. Who's going to carry this huge sack, I asked. But Mama didn't worry about things like that. Someone will help us, she said. Don't worry. So I didn't. Lori wanted to open her package and put on the bracelet before she left. It was a thin gold chain with the heart dangling on it. She helped me put it on, and I told her I would never take it off, ever. Well, goodbye then, Lori said awkwardly. Come home soon. I will, I said, although I didn't know if I would ever get back to Berkeley again. I watched Lori go down to the block, her long, blonde ponytails bouncing as she walked. I wondered who would be sitting in my desk at Lincoln Junior High now that I was gone. Lori kept turning and waving, even walking backward for a while, until she got to the corner. I didn't want to watch anymore, and I slammed the door shut. The next time the doorbell rang, it was Miss Simpson, our other neighbor. She was going to drive us to Congressional Church, which was the civil control station where all the Japanese of Berkeley were supposed to report. It was time to go. Come on, Rory, get your things, my sister called to me. It was a warm day, but I put on a sweater and my coat so I wouldn't have to carry them, and I picked up my two suitcases. Each one had a tag with my name and our family number on it. Every Japanese family had to register and get a number. We were family number 13453. Mama was taking one last look around our house. She was going from room to room as though she was trying to take a mental picture of the house she had lived in for 15 years, so she would never forget. I saw her take a long last look at the garden that Papa loved. The irises beside the fish pond were just beginning to bloom. If Papa had been home, he would have cut the first iris blossom and brought it inside to Mama. This one is for you, he would have said. And Mama would have smiled and said, thank you, Papa-san, and put it in her favorite cut glass face. But the garden looked shabby and forsaken now that Papa was gone, and Mama was too busy to take care of it. It looked the way I felt, sort of empty and lonely and abandoned. When Miss Simpson took us to the civil control station, I felt even worse. I was scared, and for a minute I thought I was going to lose my breakfast right in front of everybody. There must have been over a thousand Japanese people gathered at the church. Some were old and some were young, some were talking and laughing, and some were crying. I guess everybody else was scared, too. No one knew exactly what was going to happen us happened to us. We just knew we were being taken to tank four more racetracks, which the army had turned into a camp for the Japanese. There were 14 other camps like ours along the west coast. What scared me the most were the soldiers standing at the doorway of the church hall. They were carrying guns with mounted bayonets. If I wonder if they thought we would try to run away and whether they shoot us or come after us if their bayonets, with their bayonets if we did. A long line of buses waited to take us to camp. There were trucks, too, for our baggage, and Mama was right. Some men were there to help us load our duffel bag. When it was time to board the buses, I sat with Kiko and Mama sat behind us. The bus went down Grove Street and passed a small Japanese food store where Mama used to buy our bean curd cakes and pickled radish. The windows were all boarded up. There was a, still a sign hanging on the door that read, We are loyal Americans. The crazy thing about the whole evacuation was that, there were, we, that we were all loyal Americans. Most of us were citizens because we had been born here. But our parents, who had come from Japan couldn't become citizens because there was a law that prevented any Asian from becoming a citizen. Now everybody with a Japanese face was being shipped off to concentration camps. It's stupid, Kiko muttered as we saw the racetrack looming up beside the highway. If there were any Japanese spies around, they'd have gone back to Japan long ago. I'll say I agreed. My sister was in high school and she ought to know, I thought. 
When the bus turned into, turned into Tan Foreman, there were more armed guards at the gate, and I saw barbed wire strung around the entire grounds. I felt as though I was going into prison, but I hadn't done anything wrong. We streamed off the buses and poured into a huge room where doctors looked down our throats and peeled back our eyelids to see if we had any diseases. Then we were giving our housing assignments. The man in charge gave Mama a slip of paper. We were in Barack 16, apartment 40. Mama, I said, we're going to live in an apartment. The only apartment I ever seen was the one my piano teacher lived in. It was an enormous building in San Francisco with an elevator and thick carpeted hallways. I thought how wonderful it would have been to have our own elevator. A house was all right, but an apartment seemed elegant and special. We walked down the racetrack looking for Brack 16. Mr. Noma, a friend of Papa's, helped us carry our bags. I was so busy looking around, I slipped and almost fell on the muddy track. Army bracks had been built everywhere, all around the racetrack and even in the center oval. Mr. Noma pointed me on the track toward the horse stables. I think your barrack is out, he out there. He was right. We came to a long stable that had once hoarded the horses and the tin foreign, of tour foreign, and we climbed up the wide ramp. Each stall had a number painted on it, and when we got to 40, Mr. Noma pushed open the door. Well, here it is, he said, apartment 40. The stall was narrow and empty dark. There were two small windows on each side of the door. Three folded army cots were on the dust-covered floor, and one light bulb dangled from the ceiling. That was all. This was our apartment, and it smelled of horses. Mama looked at my sister and then at me. It won't be so bad when we fix it up, she began. I'll ask Mr. Simpson to send me some material for curtains. I can make some kitchens, too. And, well, she stopped. She couldn't think of anything more to say. Mr. Noman said he'd get, go get some mattresses for us. I'd better hurry before they're all gone, he rushed off. I think he wanted to leave so that I wouldn't see Mama cry. But he, ne he needn't have run off because Mama didn't cry. She went out to borrow a broom and began sweeping out the dust and dirt. Will you girls set up the co cots, she asked. It was only after we put up the last cot that I noticed my bracelet was gone. I've lost Lori's bracelet, I screamed. My bracelet's gone. We looked all over the stall and even down the ramp. I wanted to run back down the track and go over every inch of the ground we walked on. But it was getting dark and Mama wouldn't let me. I thought of what I promised Lori. I wasn't ever going to take that bracelet off. Not even when I went to take a shower. And now I lost it on the very first day of camp. I wanted to cry. I kept looking for it all the time we were in Tanforma. I didn't stop looking until the day we were sent to another camp called Topaz in the middle of a desert in Utah. And then I gave up. But Mama told me never mind. She said I didn't need a bracelet to remember Lori, just as I didn't need anything to remember Papa or our home in Berkeley or all the people and things we loved and had left behind. Those are things we can carry in our hearts and take us with us no matter where we are sent, she said. And I guess she was right. I've never forgotten Lori, even now. Okay, I want you to now think to yourself, um, I'm going to ask a couple questions. I want you to just think about these answers. You don't need to write them down. Um, what does Rory's family have to leave home? Why, why, do, why do they have to leave? Why does Lori give Rory a brace, bracelet? What were the bracks used for before Rory and her family came to live there? Now, I would like you to think about what lesson does Rory learn here? What does she learn... Um, what, what are some lessons? There's multiple. There's not one right answer. After you've done that, I'd like you to choose one, one of these listed below and write a memo of a page. Um, it can be double spaced and try and get creative with it. So I want you to fit into one of these roles. You can either be the author and go ahead and rewrite the end of the story in your own words. Um, and be sure to write why you chose this ending. Um, or you can be the connector, connect the story to other stories like it. Could be a book, movie, TV show. Explain what makes the stories alike. Or you can be an interviewer. Write two questions you would like to ask the main character of the story. Based on your knowledge of the story, come up with an answer you think the main character might give. Um, these can be submitted to me. Um, these can be just things you work on your own, on your own time. Um, but I really want you to do some reflection um, after reading this story. So find one of those roles, work through that, um, and really think about what it would feel like to be Rory's family and be picked up from your home. Um, even just being picked up from your home right now in this odd situation that we're all in, it's hard. But imagine having not having your family or not having these valuable things um, to hold on to.